Okay, hi, we are live. Hi everyone, we're doing our Hanukkah dance. Welcome to Lit Chick this Friday. We have an amazing guest, Jean Meltzer is here. Um, please, please comment, uh, like, share this, this live stream. We'd love to hear questions from you. Um, I'm Alex Hoops and I'm so excited to introduce Jean Meltzer. She's an awesome bio, which I'm going to read for you. Jean Meltzer has the unique distinction of being the world's only Emmy award-winning, chronically ill and disabled rabbinical school dropout. Yet it is this extraordinary background coupled with the firm belief in holding on to your joy and seeking out happy endings, which forms the basis of her diverse work. Jean received her BFA from New York University Tisch School of the Arts, Department of Dramatic Writing. Woohoo, shout out DDW. I am also an alum, 2016. Um, after graduation, Jean served as the creative director of Tapestry International, an Oscar-winning television and film production company, where she oversaw the writing, development, and production for over 250 hours of children's television and won numerous awards for her work. In 2006, Jean moved to Israel to pursue a career in the rabbinate and studied at several colleges and seminaries for five years. She also became an outspoken advocate for the disease Oh my gosh, okay, hold on. Myalgic encephalomyelitis, Emmy, <laughs> chronic fatigue syndrome, more commonly known as MECFS. In 2012, Jean ended her rabbinical studies and spent the next two years homebound due to this disease. But today, Jean is a thriving, I love this term, chronically fabulous <laughs> Jewish <laughs> life. And she sees her challenges as part of a larger journey and is eager to share her stories with others. I am so inspired by Jean. I'm obsessed with this book. So I'm really, really excited to welcome you to Lit Chick, Jean. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled. And that was you, beautiful, beautiful. You said myalgic and stuff. And the light is perfectly. It's hard for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and you did a great job. background right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, excellent. And I, I, I had heard you were a DWP uh, graduate, but they, I think back in my day they called it Department of Dramatic Writing, and then they changed it at some yeah, point. Yeah, it's had so <laughs> many like iterations and names. And I don't know if in two thousand two were they on the seventh floor of the building on Broadway. That sounds super familiar. So yeah. yes, I believe so. The seventh floor where the there was like thirty five of us writers. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah. I love. I love that Tish. program is really, yeah, incredible because Tish is known so much for film and for theater and then dramatic writing department is like this kind of nice niche that bridges the gap between both of those things. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I also write rom-com. So I think that this is like awesome for you to be here so we can talk about coming from that. I'm curious, did you do playwriting, screenwriting, TV writing? Or I was a screen. It? I was on the screenwriting track, absolutely, okay. and then I wound up in a producing television when I graduated. But I was definitely in the screenwriting track, so I definitely think you see that in in my books and everything. The classic three act structure absolutely. and the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that Tish is really good about hammering through the sort of like Aristotelian three act stuff, drumming it into your head, all of that sort of save the cat trope. So yep, yep. I think that Absolutely. I owe a lot to that program and just helping me become a very like plot driven writer as well as somebody who's Absolutely. read like, widely. I think more of my like theater stuff, I've read a lot of plays and, and novels being in that program that I might have not otherwise come across. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think yeah. It's a, it's a cool way in. It's not as traditional as a creative writing, you know, MFA or background, but I think it's it's similar. And having a background in theater and film just helps you in every aspect of your life anyway, because you're always Absolutely. Like, <laughs> on your toes and perform and collaborate and all of that stuff. So I definitely, I definitely resonate with that. So we're here to talk about the matzo ball. This is incredible Ooh. book, came out on Tuesday, Mazel Tov. Um, could you kind of like give us the pitch for where, what the matzo ball is about? Sure. My book is called The Matzo Ball, and it's an own voices Hanukkah rom-com about a chronically ill, nice Jewish girl named Rachel Rubenstein Goldblatt. She's the daughter of a world famous rabbi, but she also happens to have a secret career as a best selling Christmas romance novelist. <laughs> so when her publisher tasks her with writing a Hanukkah romance, 
she has no idea what to do because everyone who's Jewish knows Hanukkah is a minor holiday. It doesn't quite have the same magic as Christmas. So she, she goes on this like, desperate search for inspiration and it lands her at the matzah ball, which she hears about, which is a high-end Jewish party uh, held on the last night of Hanukkah. There's only one problem, of course, because we're in a rom-com. Uh, tickets are completely sold out and the only way to get one is direct from the uh, matzah ball's creator, who happens to be Jacob Greenberg, her summer camp arch enemy. And that's where the fun begins. <laughs> so, <laughs> And it is so much fun. And the premise is so genius too. It's like, I, I, it's crazy to me that we haven't had a, rom a Hanukkah rom-com before. And just like the, the setup is just genius. Like every single element of sort of the Jewish experiences here, as well as this important story about somebody suffering from CFS. So just kudos to you, first of all, for pulling it off. I know as somebody working on my own books, like, you know, it's always a puzzle piece and it feels like this one really clicked together in such a smart way. Um, and I also love that you say this thing about Hanukkah being a minor Jewish holiday. I think everybody's been feeling with the Jewish holidays recently, especially I think we had Rosh Hashanah on Labor Day this year. Yeah. It's just like, you're almost so burnt out by the time that you reach like Sukkot, you're like, oh my God, okay. And then the real like American or Christian holiday season starts back up and you're like, okay, I guess we're just- It never stops, it never stops. <laughs> yeah, like, no, I just- <laughs> I joke our sukkah will be up to like, you know, February because we are those people, you know? So like, it's just too, you get too busy and it's like, we, we get it up, but like getting it down seems really, which I yeah. think also happens with Christmas lights for a lot of people. Absolutely. So <laughs> might as well, it's part of the furniture. Right, so we'll just, it's a tent. Yes. And I love that we're having this conversation on October 1st. I feel like so much of my social media timeline is like, all right, it's spooky season or like, you know, Yay. we're getting everything started. And so this book is so perfect for that. I feel like there's no shame in the long holiday game right now, as we were saying in the green room before, like we all really need joy and sparkle and sweetness. And so I love this that, you know, maybe during COVID we've been a little more jolly than we might have been otherwise, but yeah. we deserve it. So yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. I think, thank you so much. I think actually a lot of that joyousness comes out of my experience with chronic illness. You mentioned in my bio yeah. how I was two years really like homebound, bedbound, not really able to leave the house, except I remember every now and then I would get to the grocery store for an hour. And that was like my big, like I left the house. I, wow. But it was a really scary time. Um, that I didn't really know what if I would ever really be able to like leave or or go shopping or have a normal life outside of you know my bed. Um, but I, in order to sort of survive those very low moments with chronic illness, and I think this is something probably many people with chronic illness, whether it's MECFS or Lyme or fibromyalgia, anyone who's been disabled by chronic illness, I think you have to learn how to hold on to your joy. And so I think if you see in my book that they're almost over the top joyous, especially written in a pandemic or during a pandemic, it comes from this place that that is how I have learned to survive by focusing on the good of my life. And I am thrilled that I have written a book that focuses on the good for other people. Absolutely. I mean, and it's such a contagious joy too. I feel like I had like an insatiable hunger for more of that when I finished it so much so that I started watching Christmas movies on Netflix because I was just like, I got I it. it. <laughs> I it's like it. a drug. <laughs> yeah. like and I think, you know, your story with, with chronic illness, I think resonates with so many readers. And I feel like this book is very successful in communicating you know what that feels like and the challenges that come with somebody who's suffering from from a chronic illness but also you know that they're able to experience a lot of the same things that many of us are and that their joy comes from a similar place uh and i feel like yeah rachel in particular and i'd love to talk about rachel is such a great protagonist because she she's very you know successful she's a successful christmas author um, but she's got secrets, which makes for every great protagonist that slowly reveals <laughs> itself throughout the book. 
And she's also incredibly stubborn. I think that that was something I related to about her too, where she was like, you know, I'm going to do this, even though maybe it's going to make me tired or ruin this relationship or whatever. She knows yeah. what she wants, which I think is really successful. And part of what she wants, although she doesn't know she wants it, is Jacob, who yeah. is <laughs> Woon, just the perfect romantic lead. He's French. Who's your but... stud muffin? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that this is like the perfect and explicitly like most Jewish meet cute is that we first uh, see Jacob at Shabbat and he yeah. is sh schmoozing with her mom and dad, talking to the old folks, talking to her relatives, just being like the epitome of the nice Jewish boy. It was like yeah. kind of like nice Jewish boy porn almost we were like yes like shake hands with mom clean up from yes, dinner yes. <laughs> like, right your I mom is already so like dreaming about the grandchildren <laughs> and the, <laughs> exactly. the cruise trips you're gonna take together yes you know yes we uh, that, guy. <laughs> that guy meanwhile you're like oh you made my life miserable in yes. seventh grade <laughs> Which, i mean that's another element so i mean this is really wonderfully like just a pot full, a matzo ball soup, if you will, of all yeah. the vegetables of the Jewish experience. But <laughs> we also have Jewish summer camp in here, oh, right? Of camp Ahava, <laughs> where uh, Rachel and Jacob met. I know many Jewish people have this experience at summer camp that is extremely definitive. And I think, you know, it's not just like regular summer camp for a lot of people, because this might be the only opportunity to be around people who share your beliefs or are dealing with sort of similar cultural questions that you may be asking yourself. I'd love to know, like, did that idea come to you straight away in the novel? To put them into Jewish yeah. summer camp. So for me, I knew that I wanted to write a Jewish romance. I felt very keenly that it had to be a Hanukkah romance. Yeah. And I, I knew that I wanted to sort of take all the tropes of a typical sort of Christmas style Hallmark film yeah or a Christmas book, but I, I felt it was incredibly important that it would still feel sort of authentically Jewish, right. that that it wasn't just Jewish Christmas, some things, or, or that it wasn't just sort of like plugged in, you know, like, okay, they're in a Hanukkah sweater. I really wanted to sort of like talk about, add little bits and pieces of like what our culture and history was. So the idea of like Jewish summer camp, I, I think exactly you called it, it's very formative, for a lot of Jews. It might be the only time where they're in a, for many of us, a predominantly like Jewish culture where they're able to like rehash um, their own religious beliefs or theological beliefs. Um, and it's also for the Jewish world, I think it's a lot of us, we will see the same faces if we come from a community, whether it's in camp and then college. I mean, it was amazing when I, even though I would say I come from a more secular background, when I went into rabbinical school, um, I, I met up with people I knew from third grade, right? right. And the Jewish and geography stuff, too, the Jewish right? geography, right? So, but definitely like Jewish summer camp, I think is very fundamental to sort of our cultural experience. And for this book, I was like, well, it's just, I wanted to add sort of that layer of authenticity. So I thought yeah. that was really cool. And also because Jacob and Rachel come from such different Jewish backgrounds, I love, and I had an experience where I went to a more observant camp for one summer. Mm -hmm. um, but mainly I went to like, I always went to Jewish programs, but I was like that kid in USY who would like yeah. sit in the corner <laughs> and not know what was going on. Um, so, uh, you know, I really wanted to sort of reflect those two sort of Jewish worlds and Jewish identities and sort of like their meeting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a success of this book, and I'm sure also sort of a burden to bear as somebody writing the sort of first of these is to feel like you're not representing just a singular Jewish experience, but that the experience is huge. I mean, you have this character, Mickey, who's black and gay, and there are people who are reform or Shomer Shabbos or kosher or Hasidic, all of them we meet throughout the book. And I think that's something I really appreciated is you're able to recognize yourself in the book, but I think many people will have that experience because, you know, it's whatever clicks for you. Yeah, um, I think it was so yeah. interesting too, because someone talked about how, uh, like sort of like this idea of like nationhood, and even though they all have very 
different backgrounds or belief systems or how they engage in their Judaism, it's sort of the, I, they, they all have sort of a connection. And yeah, I really wanted, I really wanted to make it sort of as open and diverse. And, and you'll notice in the book, I never actually say this person's conservative or this person's right. orthodox. I really wanted it to just be like, they're all Jews. And it doesn't matter, like for, for each of them, they identify themselves however they do, but they're all Jews. And so right. that was like, again, the most joyous and loving way I could, you know, uh, ex try to explore Jewish culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Jean, I wanna take a step back because I could talk about this book forever and ever and ever, but I've got to know you have had like this long career of working in the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. obviously have been struggling with the chronic illness. We're in the middle of a pandemic. How did the matzo ball come to be? Did you, have you always wanted to write a novel? Was this something that, an opportunity that came about? I'm curious how you kind of got here. So I will flat out say that when I was younger, I would always tell people like, I am not good enough to write a book. Like I am not a good enough writer to write a book. I would say that all the time. I was like, screenplay, yeah, that's, you know, they're easy. Yeah, 115 pages, dialogue, super easy. But I was like, I'm not good enough to write a book. Um, you know, life is funny. The journey is circuitous. I wound up, you know, I wound up, I was in entertainment. I decided to leave entertainment and go into the rabbinet. I was in the rabbinet for a very long time. And then I, my chronic illness worsened and I found myself sort of like homebound. And, uh, you know, I, I say I haven't been able to really work outside the home in the last decade. And so, you know, I'm not in LA or New York right now, you know, and so in terms of like, career options and things that, you know, I haven't, I've mainly been focusing on my health and writing has sort of been part of my wellness journey. So how I wound up just deciding I was going to write a book was really like, I was in the house. What else was I going to, it was that Netflix is, I love you, Netflix. I love you, but you can only watch so many hours before you, yeah, as everyone from the pandemic knows, you run out of things. Right. Yeah. So, so for me, like it became part of like my healing journey, right. Of like meditation and, and good food and like resting and then, you know, writing because what else was there to do when you're yeah. uh, chronically ill? Um, and I've always been a writer. So I've always been a storyteller. I don't really know how to not write. I joked with someone the other day, writers never really stop writing. They just get delayed, right? Yeah. So for me, I, I think I was just sort of delayed. And as I've gotten older and more patient in my own work, you know, uh, it, it, writing the book came around. But I've been writing now stories for years and, and mainly not even for the last several years, not even looking necessarily towards traditional publishing, just really writing for myself. Right. Which is, I think that's how you know that you really have the writing bug is like you were saying this sort of like need to do it as a way to process the world around you, process what's happening inside your head. I find that to be true too. It's like every time I think, okay, I'm done with that. I'm just going to, you know, do my corporate job or X, Y, and Z. It keeps pulling you back. I think yeah. and that's it's like a bug. Yeah, 100%. You need it. And I think that the fact that you're processing a lot of similar experiences to the protagonist, Rachel, was probably useful. And in many ways, also, like, this is such a perfect marriage of the screenwriting, plotting, kind of fictional stuff, and your experience in rabbinical school, I would imagine. They kind of come together here. Yeah, and I think also, too, you know, I haven't talked about this aspect of it. I've talked a lot about, like, what you know, being a nice Jewish girl and wanting to see myself represented, represented. But one of the reasons it was so important to me too was, you know, that I had an experience with my niece who's seven years old and she was like sitting on my lap and she looked at me and she goes, Aunt Jeannie, big noses are ugly. And, and you know, my, my little sweet niece, I didn't want to break it to her, but she's surrounded by like strong Jewish women and chances are she's going to have a big lovely size nose one day but you know and i was trying to and i was really surprised like where this came from she's surrounded by strong jewish women she goes to jewish day school she's only seven right then and, she, and she's already internalizing sort of this idea that like something about her or her features is not correct and i really one of the reasons i didn't know what i would do with the matzo ball but i really really knew that i wanted my nieces and nephews to have stories where they were heroes, where they were sexy, where they were 
where they were living their life and joyous that growing up, I didn't have those stories. The only time I ever saw like other Jews was usually in Holocaust fiction or things like that. So I wanted to really create something, even if it never went anywhere except into her hands, I wanted a book where nobody, nobody apologized for their identity. And so that, you know, that sort of is where it came from too. I think that's wonderful. And, and that's so important too, to be able to, to see yourself as important, right? We talk about representation a lot these days, but also being careful that the kind of representation that we're being shown is important. And I know that, you know, the BIPOC community also feels they don't only want to see movies and, and films about oppression or challenging histories or struggle. It's also these stories of joy, which is this book okay. is just pure joy. And I think yeah. that you've done that really successfully. It's interesting that you bring that up too about the sort of Jewish noses conundrum. There's this whole controversy going on. I don't know if you've been following with Jewish actors or actresses getting cast. I heard, um, I just saw like a Time magazine. Or yeah, something that's article the article that. that I'm yeah referring to, which was basically just noticing a pattern now that for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, a non-Jew was cast. I think, I can't remember which actor was cast, but they just are making a Joan Rivers biopic and they cast a non-Jewish woman. And it's it's opening up a lot of different interesting conversations. conversations. I don't know that there's necessarily a right a answer. Right answer, right. Yeah. <laughs> but it is important too that like, you know, somebody like Sarah Silverman, who's doing the more like goofy sort of typical role that you might see a Jewish woman in, does become like, you know, we very quickly make that the the template. And so having more varied experiences. So important. Oh, absolutely too. And also seeing more varied experiences of the Jewish faith and the Jewish world and just the whole spectrum of humanity. I really encourage everybody with a story to tell to go out and write their own story and to tell absolutely. their story because, you know, I will be the first in line to read those books. So uh, please go, you know, we should all be telling our stories. This is you know, that is the beauty of our universe. Absolutely. So. And I learned so much too reading this book, even though I'm a member of the Jewish community and I've been, you know, very involved in it my whole life, I still learned things that I didn't know before. So I think that that's, that's really important. And, and yeah, there's so many contradictions too. I think that's another thing. It's not steadfast. One of the scenes that I really love is Shabbat in the Rachel's home where you know, they are pretty conservative about their Shabbat observance. There's no electricity, right? They're going to services. They're doing waiting until Havdalah to turn the lights on. And yet, you know, we have a guest in the home, Jacob, who does turn the light on and does use the shower. And I think so many people see things so rigidly that they don't feel comfortable knowing that there is a lot more gray area than you might expect. And I think that's something that the matzo ball in particular does so well. So yeah, kudos. for me, it was important to sort of break down the sort of barriers to entrance with Judaism. So for me, I wanted people to experience if they, you know, by barriers to entrance, I mean, if you don't live in a community or you're not part of a community for whatever reason, you might not experience that 20 person Shabbat dinner or what it means to be in a uh, observant home. And so I was just hoping by writing those scenes that I would give people access to that world. Absolutely. And I do think that that is a stereotype of Judaism is that there's so many rules, it's more dogmatic, it's hard to break in. If you want to convert, you have to do so many things. And I think, I think the non Jews see that and think, okay, I'm just not gonna worry or, or I feel like it's inappropriate to ask maybe. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really glad that that you open that door. And, and I also too want to talk about Jean. So you've decided to write this book, but you decided to write it in the romantic comedy genre. So I would love to hear a little bit more about like why this genre was the perfect place for you to be to be writing in this space. Are you a big fan of rom-com in general? Was so, it the sort of genre formula that made it easier? So I'm curious. I will I will die. I've mentioned this already that when I wrote the matzo ball, I was not really in a place where I was thinking about traditional publishing necessarily. Yeah. So one thing you need to understand about me is I did not pick up my first romance novel till like my late 30s. Mm -hmm. I, um, and I, I tell this story, it's kind of a funny story. So just bear with me, which was okay. basically like, I 
um, was sort of just like perusing on Kindle. This was part of when I was starting to feel better. And I was one of the ways I was focusing on my health and wellness was I really cut out anything negative. So like turned off the news, you know, like made very focused on my healing. And like part of that healing was like anything I would consume, whether it was media books had to be happy and joyous. Mm -hmm. So one night I'm like part of my meditation, candles, bathtub time, whatever, looking for a book on Kindle. And I see a book by Helen Hart, I believe it was called like Bloodborne or something. Mm -hmm. Bloodborne. I'm sorry, Helen, if I got it wrong because you started my romance journey. Um, but I I opened it up and I was like, oh, I haven't read about vampires in a long time. So I start, you know, perusing through the free pages that they give you. And I'm like, oh, good, good. And then on the second, I won't use the word, but on the second page, and for no reason I could even begin to like discern, she used a very graphic and explicit word for like male genitalia. And I was like, I was like, I was like, what? Is this what is this? What? I was like, that's, but no, and I was like, I did not know what I was reading, but I was like, yeah. I want more. And I like devoured like six of her books, like, you know, $3.99, I get like over and over. And from that moment on, like I became a romance reader. Amazing. And so from like, I was doing like indies and I was going into Harlequin and I was doing category and inspirational. And what I loved about it was it was again, part of this like journey of healing and wellness, which was like, and, and of course, Debbie McCumber, um, you know, that I could, it was so good and joyous and it, it didn't add toxicity or neg negativity in my life. And mm -hmm. so when I, I don't think there was any other thought of a rom-com other than like, I wanted to stay in that space. I didn't want to write um, something dark. I didn't want to write serial killers. I didn't want to write, you know, I could have done a lot of Jewish type of books, but I just didn't want for my own well-being. I didn't want to journey into those territories. I wanted to stay in that light, loving, positive atmosphere. Absolutely. I love that that you found that and it was like kind of candy just at the right time. And I Absolutely. think- <laughs> I, I felt that way too. And I think particularly, you know, romance is having this moment, right? It's like all over all these publishing things. But I think a lot of it is because when we're living in challenging times, we we're looking for, you know, an opportunity to escape. But escape doesn't mean that we are erasing or ignoring all of these other kind of complicated questions. So I think that that's sometimes a bad rap that romance gets, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's got blinders on to reality or something like that, which isn't really the case. It's just sort of reality where you know you're going to get a happy ending, which right. is a gift to give yourself right now when so much else is uncertain, so... Yeah, we've lost sort of, you know, we grow up and I think a lot of us, we've lost sort of the ability to be playful and to to have the, you know, to just really allow ourselves to have that enjoyment. I joke in romance, I'm here for the billionaire who does laundry. You know, life is hard. It's hard. And it's okay to like, yeah, I think it's exactly right. You want those peaks and ebbs and flow. You want serious topics because very Jewish, how do you know joy without sadness, right? How do you, right? So you need the peaks and ebbs and flows. But really, you know, I think, I think romance is a gift to ourselves. So people should go out and buy those gifts for themselves. <laughs> I love that, that you describe it too. I mean, like writing, like therapy, like eating vegetables or exercising or drinking water. I do think that there is a case to be made for kind of adding romance consumption to sort of your wellness repertoire. Yes. I think that it's super important. So if you're looking to feel better, yes, check it out for sure. I think that I didn't come to romance right away either. I'm, I'm, you know, new-ish in the the writing world, but I think it, I, I came at it at a moment that I needed it, and it's really helped me deal with a lot yes. of this other, other stuff. Um, so we had a question in the the comment section that I was going to ask to Jean, which was, how have your rabbinical studies enhanced your writing? And I wanted to just mention, I read your acknowledgments. As somebody who's writing and also somebody who's worked in publishing, I love the acknowledgment sections of these books so much because it's really a place to see all of the wonderful people who worked to make the book happen beyond the author. And I know that you thank lots of people, including some people who gave you sort of advice in the, you know, sort of more Jewish theological space. So I'd love to hear kind of, did you do research for this? Well, you know, I 
studied a lot at this point. So I would say yeah. that like, absolutely, like, you know, I, I did not have a great Jewish education before rabbinical school. Um, and I would definitely say that even beyond like what I learned in the classroom, I think the experience of, of traveling in these various communities or living in these various communities um, were absolutely fundamental to not just this book, but, but all, all the books I plan to write with sort of a Jewish worldview. And I mean, really, we use the term halakhic mindset, right? That the, the idea of a Jewish law, right? It's a very different way of sort of experiencing and walking through the world than maybe um, someone who is not a halakhic Jew or someone who does not go by Jewish law. So again, wanting to really reflect those, but absolutely everything from, you know, Judaism is a beautiful, rich tradition filled with lots of wisdom, especially in terms of relationships, marriage, sexuality. And um, it's wonderful to be writing these books and then to be able to pull on, you know, text, whether it's Midrash or Talmud or Jewish law in order to sort of like amplify the story Jewishly in one form or another. Yeah, I felt that was true. I love this concept of Bashert, right? Ugh. That you have a person who's the other half of you. And I think that this story did a little bit too of it's not just Rachel finding her soulmate, but she's also in a way sort of finding her soul purpose, finding herself. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I think that that, you know, it's a, maybe a more modern or a different way of looking at it is maybe you don't need another person to complete you, but maybe you do need sort of to meet yourself <laughs> again. Um, yeah. And one thing interesting in Judaism is a bashert doesn't actually have to be limited to your marriage partner. Mm -hmm. um, a bashert can be a best friend. It can be somebody, really the idea in Judaism, you know, all Jews have a mandate of like tikkun olam, which is like to fix it, the world, to make it better. Um, and and that ties into everything. And the idea of bashert, this idea of destiny is you are here to do something. You're paying rent on the earth, right? So it doesn't need to be someone you marry. It doesn't need to be a love interest. It can be a mother. It can be a sister. It can be a friend. You can have multiple bashers. So, which is ideas that are actually in the second book. Um, but absolutely, like it's it's part of much more, much bigger of like an idea of like destiny and making the world a better place. Which I yeah, and that's that's really what I think that Rachel and Jacob are trying to do ultimately. And it's such a noble goal. And I think that you know it's one we can really get behind is that it's not it's not self-serving or maybe it appears that way to them initially but you know in an excellent dramatic writing craft way right you have your you know surface level want and then this deeper desire and and Absolutely. i think that both of them are fulfilled in a non-spoiler way that i will not say on the show because i want people to keep reading i want to uh -huh. talk for a second about this matzo ball which I think it's incredible. I think that this is like a BBYO thing. Maybe I've also heard like people having matzo balls or other celebrations to meet other young Jewish people you mentioned. But this is like matzo ball on Lux. steroids. <laughs> yeah. and there was something so nice about, you know, we're in a pandemic. It's incredibly difficult to gather large numbers of people. I'm in the process of planning a wedding that's going to happen in like five years. <laughs> Thank you so much. But but it's also like we got to have a party, and this party is incredible. I mean, we have like acrobatics and a gigantic menorah and incredible food. These latkes with a little like tartar on top. I was like, I know, I need that. I need that right what now. What was your like yeah. research for that? Like, were you was that just from like Jean's fantasy brain, or did you and, watch stuff? Yeah, that's my that's that. Well, I mean, in fairness, I've been to lots of Jewish single events. Yeah, sure. before I got, <laughs> like every good Jewish girl, you know, I I, I got dressed up and went to plenty of events. Yeah. Um, but but no, a lot of that was just uh, again from you know if I was going to be throwing this party, what would it look like? What would I want to have? Um, you know, and just I think that it's kind of Jacob Greenberg's character too. He is a little bit over the top in how he does things, um, and and Rachel, you know, and it's interesting because really again you're supposed to publicize the miracle of Hanukkah, right? So why well, you I put mean, the menorah I, in the window, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're supposed to, you know, yeah. And so it's sort of interesting that like Jacob really, 
even though he's he's not really from the same world, he he goes all out to publicize his miracle. So <laughs> it's so much fun. It sounds like the best the best party ever. Um, yeah. I'm gonna see if we have. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I know that there are lots of people that have, and I should also say, folks, if you're looking for a great book club read, this book has a lot of really wonderful bonus material, um, including a reader's guide in the back matter and a lot of information to help facilitate conversation. So if you're inspired by what we're talking about today, I definitely suggest grabbing a copy, grabbing some friends, getting some chocolate. This is just such a, a book that's so uh, ripe for discussion. So Sylvia asks, that's a great question. How much time do you invest in writing each day? So it's a quite process a, question, which I could talk yeah, about forever. Yeah, quite a bit, actually. Um, I am not a speedy writer by any stretch of the imagination. And if I'm dealing with brain fog, that can be particularly terrible. So, I mean, I, I'm getting better with my uh, balancing now that I have to do a lot more of the social media and publicity. Um, and I, I, but yeah, I, I spend, I can spend several hours a day writing. I mean, easily. I, I do, you know, take my weekends and try to, you know, focus on my health, but definitely I can, I'm a slow writer. <laughs> Slow, but worth it. Yeah. How long did the matzo ball take you from start to finish, would you say? So the actual like first draft only took surprisingly about four four months. Mm -hmm. um, and then revisions and things probably took another six months. That's great. So actually, it was very, this was very much a book, I think, because it came from such a deep place and just, it was so much of all these things that are just part of my existence. I think it went much faster than and you know a book right. that if i was I it was do like living research. inside you probably for so long and then i think it was actually i feel I like everything sort of led to the matzo ball <laughs> and i love also you know we have rachel as a christmas novelist so there's a little bit of sort of publishing tongue-in-cheek happening here too with her yeah. editor and <laughs> agent asking for a copy i mean you people if i can ask where people like so stoked about this idea because I feel like it's so refreshing. I feel like you're going to spawn like dozens of other Hanukkah romances. I think, you know, there, there's there been, I, I, I don't know why it took to 2021 to have really like this level or this type of traditional um, Hanukkah sort of rom-com, but people were absolutely stoked. I mean, I, I was actually really surprised. Like <laughs> I remember writing the book and being like, this isn't, no one's gonna want this. This is sort of an exercise in futility, but I'll give it to my niece. I'll, I'll self-publish. I don't know what I'll do with it, but I really, I really never thought it would get picked up, and I, I especially never thought it would roll the way it kind of did with like translations or all the attention, um, and the love. Honestly, like I just want to say to everybody watching, the love has been just overwhelming. Like it's, it's. I'm. I wake up every day with a smile on my face. So thank you to everybody out there who has been supportive and joyous and happy for this book to be here. It just means the world to me and to other people who will see themselves seen in it. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, it's a huge <laughs> gift that you've given to us. So we're very grateful as well. And I wanted to ask too, I was thinking about stuff at the back of the book. I think we get a little sneak peek of your next project. So. If you're comfortable, I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about what's coming in 2022. Sure. My book is called, uh, the second book will be called Mr. Perfect on Paper. And uh, for all the reasons I felt it was super important to write a super Jewy uh, romance between two Jewish leads, uh, I, I feel the same way about it being an interfaith romance. Um, so Mr. Perfect on Paper is uh, about a woman named Dara Rabinowitz, who's a third generation shachamit or matchmaker. Um, and she finds her uh, list for the perfect Jewish husband outed on national television by her bubby. Um, but as a nationwide hunts and shoes, Dar comes to learn essentially, uh, or begins to wonder uh, as she's looking for this perfect match, uh, her heart is really being led towards Christopher Steadfast, the totally charming not Jewish reporter following her story. So I say simply it's an interfaith romance, but I really, to quote a Yiddishism, it's about how man plans and God's fast. And the important thing to know 
is that it is uh, like my ball sort of inspired by my own love story. Um, I was a first year rabbinical student, deeply committed to my faith when dun, 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 I fell in love with a non-Jewish man. So I always leave the story right there. Um, I'm sure anyone watching could imagine all the complications that came from that. Um, and so that was really something I wanted to explore in Mr. Perfect on paper, sort of, um, you know, our, the, our, when our cultures and our hearts sort of are in uh, juxtaposition and how we sort of work that out. That and hopefully sounds- it'll be a story that relates to for a lot of people. I'm sure. I love that the the interfaith conversation is coming up. I think that that's something a lot of young Jews are thinking about too, and the pressure about that. I do have to say, and our producer Julie said, Christopher Steadfast is just such a great name for a character. <laughs> yeah, he's a killer. I love it. I'm mad I didn't grab it, but he sounds he sounds hot just based he's on hot. The name. He's hot. like rugged cowboy, southern like. Basically, totally op- opposite of Dara Rabinowitz. <laughs> yeah, <I can> imagine. <laughs> but opposites attract, yeah, and that's a perfect yes. concept for, for a romance. And I love that you're continuing this sort of, you know, exploration of these Jewish themes. I think people are really, really hungry for it. So I'm so uh, excited to read it. I want an early copy. Woo, <laughs> um, absolutely. Best of luck. We'll get you one. <laughs> yeah, that's the luck. That's like, I mean, and this also this matzo ball promotion stuff, we should say, is continuing through the end of the year. So if you're interested in checking more of what Jean's doing, all of her information about her tour is on her website. Um, and Jean, I, I have to ask too, is the second book also sit, set in New York City? Yes. It is. Okay. Because that's another kind of big element of the matzo ball as well. Yeah. I love that joke that you made about the Upper West Side, Upper East Side, long distance relationship. It's true. It's true. It you is know, my- so true. It's so funny how many of my friends in this city are like, yeah, I just, we had to break up because- He was in the, the train. <laughs> right. You can't do that. That's like, it's like a different country. Like, I know. What, I will never- I knew my, my husband was the right one because he was from Staten Island and he would always- he would do the commute to the Upper West Side wow. every weekend. So, which is like an hour and a half each way. So yes, it, when you're in an, it's, it's a long distance relationship. <laughs> but really like we're pretty spoiled in Manhattan, I, I would say, definitely. Yeah, that's <laughs> so fun. And the Upper West Side is just such a perfect, my my boyfriend's family is from there and it's, it's a really specific, special place and you absolutely nailed it. I hope you get like a Zabar sponsorship or something oh, like that. Oh, you gotta find a I way to all the vegetarian chopped liver, my fave. Yes. And the smoked salmon and the lox, my favorite. Please. Like please. make a goal to like get them on your socials. ASAP. I know. <laughs> just <laughs> shots of me eating I constantly. Think that's how you, start it. you just have to do it unprompted, tag them a bunch of times, and then the smoked salmon just rolls in. Rolls just all the smoked salmon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's why, the real reason I wrote the matzo ball. Well, I <laughs> mean, food, food is huge. It's huge in the book. I like, I wanted literally everything that they were eating. My last question for Eugene, I guess, is are you celebrating Hanukkah any differently this year? Um, You know, we're pro- we have always, so we always like decorate really, really big and we do mm-hmm. the front of the house, believe it or not. And there's no more room in my house for stuff, but I think we're going to get even more Hanukkah stuff. Um, so yeah, we we are going to go all out. Like it's getting to the point where like cars stop and take pictures. So, you know, we're going to make sure all the cars stop going forward. So I love yeah, we, that. Yeah. That was always so important to me. I grew up in a very non-Jewish community in the Midwest and I always wanted us to decorate. It's just so, I just felt so much FOMO. And I was like, I don't care. It can be neutral white lights but we cannot be the dark house on the street <laughs> oh we got a lot we got a blow up mensch on the bench we got a like nine foot menorah we got we have every it, we, it's 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 a lot we are we are hanukkahville so <laughs> you get one of the like radio stations that they play dreidel, dreidel, that, dreidel. that's the next step that that <laughs> will be the next step <laughs> well now that you're like this bona fide hanukkah author you like absolutely have the ability to go for it and nobody's gonna say anything that's right. 
<laughs> they'll be like, oh, you know, <laughs> she must really like Hanukkah, which I do. Yeah, it's like so, Debbie Beckhamer is the queen of Christmas. You can be like the queen, queen, the queen of Hanukkah. Of Hanukkah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Jean, thank you so much for thank being on Lit Chick. We are so thrilled to have you. I know that our viewers are so stoked about the matzo ball. So please grab a copy um, from your local indie, preferably. Jean, is there a bookstore in Virginia that you can direct people to if they sure. want to buy from so, a local? So I also found in bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. You can get signed copies though if you order the paperback. So there's information uh, on my page um, and that's a great place to start out your search. They have lots of copies waiting for you. That's great. Yeah, I know. Well, I do want to say to everybody, there has been supply chain issues in the publishing industry. I don't know if anybody's listening, but go for your Hanukkah and Christmas gifts now. Why wait? You can hide it in the attic if you need to. Grab that stuff now. Time is moving quickly. It's October 1st, so it's practically New Year's Eve. <laughs> That's right. It goes quick. <laughs> But thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We're thrilled to have you. Our sort of holiday theme continues next week. We'll have author Sonia Lali on to talk about a holly jolly Diwali, which is so much fun to say. So we will be in a festive spirit for many weeks to come. And thank you so much to our producer, Julie Gerstenblatt, and my co-host, Jenna Payon. Um, and thank you so much to Jean Meltzer for joining us this week. Bye, everyone.